Clearly we have uh, one transfer there. So please have a seat. Pianos, pianos. <laughs> Say it well. I'm learning uh, Japanese with our colleagues from Japan. Please, Ioannis, Pablo, Jonathan. You're going to have lunch. You, you know your wife doesn't want you to drink too much coffee. Oh, it's a tea. Oh, nice. So, I hope you're ready for the next session. Because uh, after the two talks we're going to have, we're going to have uh, pitch talks. So I see two more talks. So as we're here for sharing, we're sharing the time as well. So instead of five minutes pitch talk, it's four minutes pitch talk, which make it e even more uh, challenging. So for the pitch talk, wha what I would like to have is that we don't have on the web, web, str uh, web stream is uh, we don't see uh, the assembly here, but we can hear you. So maybe we can start warming up and how we're going to re react to the pitch talk. Uh, and what I want you to, to do is having a, a yes and different level of the yes. If you agree and you love the, the idea of one of the pitch, you say yes. Yeah. Well, I mean you say yes, I love it. Uh, but if you don't really agree, you just say yes, yes. But I want to hear this translate into big sound. You know. So for, for an example, do you like the idea of having a pitch session? Yeah, more there. I, I will try again. Uh, pitch session is amazing. Uh, we, we can share ideas that comes up after sharing ideas here and discussing. So do you like the idea of having a pitch session? Yes! Yes, okay. Good, good. So uh, our next speakers. First, we start for with our speakers. We're going to start with uh, Stefano Speletta. He was a system engineer at uh, Innovative Solutions in Space. Uh, uh, Aka Isis is now researchers at TU Delft. He has uh, many articles on uh, ResearchGate, so he shares openly his articles. That's, that's very nice. And he's working on different things like nanosat communication, modular architectures, and uh, CubeSat to pocket cubes opportunities and challenges. I think this is uh, an interesting article you can read from him. And uh, I talked to him, and uh, I think uh, this is a person I would love to work with. And um, and today is going to talk about how do you do collaborative hardware development if you're not sitting next to each other, and that's uh, that's one of the challenges. So please, Stefano, spell it. Okay, thank you very much. Now let's go. Well, there's going to be a lot of stuff, so I'll try not to run too much. One thing is I wanted to start with why I am here. Well, as he said, I have a lot of solutions. Actually, maybe not. I have a lot of problems. That's for sure the case. And I'm here and I like a lot the fact that we can talk because, well, yeah, maybe you know, or maybe you faced already the problems I have and maybe there is a really good solution for it. But no, let's start. This is what we tried to do and what we've done. So here I randomized a little bit the title, so just to mess up a bit with your mind. But no, let's go. Well, PQ, PQ9, what does it mean? Uh, PQ stands for Pocket Cubes, which is a smaller version of a CubeSat. Kind of the very similar idea, but yeah, CubeSats have been around for what? 10 years, 15 years? No, it's getting boring. No, 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 don't do that. Let's do something else. Th that was the original idea. So yeah, you can see the picture. It's fairly small. This is the right size for, uh, for a coin. So in theory, there's an American professor that could fit that into his pocket. Okay, Americans have all, everything is big, so the pocket is also big. But no, why? Why do you want to make it small? Well, think about ants or insects. Basically, you get intelligence from the huge amount of uh, uh, animals. So that could be something you could try out. Uh, well, try to deploy a couple of hundred CubeSats. Unless you have the 150 whatever millions planet has, it becomes a rather difficult game. So, well, just to sort of give you a little bit more clear idea of a pocket cube, Nah, it's kind of the same volume as a beer, so well, that, that should be a good reference. 
In terms of power, we're orbit average, we're a bit below the watt, so it, you can compare it with your phone, more or less. And well, the aim is at the total cost of around 30K, which, okay, is like a car. Uh, launching a CubeSat is more or less the price of a very fancy car. This is kind of a sort of normal, a little bit fancier than normal car. Well, just very quick, again, as CubeSats, they are just modular things. We like them to call them P. There's no real, well, P pocket. No, U unit was a bit more meaningful, but okay, just to do something different. Well, PQ9, what did we do? Well, uh, there are standards, which is basically one person doing something and then putting a name standard. That's, the, that's what we did as well. What we tried to do was to make it a bit more open so that people could see, people could comment. Uh, the idea was just put it on GitHub and then people maybe will say something. It was good. I had a couple of talks with, uh, with people sitting here. That was great. Uh, what did we put? Well, the standard, we're now trying to define the way we build the board. So you see the, a template for the board that people could use. Uh, we tried to put it on GitHub, but this is actually hardware. It's not software. GitHub was meant mainly, the, the original idea was more for software, which is great. You get a lot of tools for software, but well, you'll see at the end, they don't work that well with hardware. And that's the big issue. We're also trying to put a interface control document. Okay, not exactly as detailed as you may think here at ESOC, but okay, let's call it ICD. And we're almost there. Then we're gonna put it out so people can look at it, comment, maybe we gain something, maybe the others gain something as well. We also put software in there. So you can see, well, what did we do? This is a board, uh, real size. We started trying to define a standard for the bus, which is basically the interconnection between all the systems. It looks a lot like a CubeSat where you stack things on top of each other, which is great, it's simple, it can be fun. But in a CubeSat you get this huge bulky black block on the, on the side, which annoys quite a lot of people. So we try to sort of squeeze it out and make it as small as possible. That's why we tossed out almost everything. This is as minimal as, as we could build it, uh, which has advantages and disadvantages as well. Uh, so the standardization started with the bus, as simple and as robust as possible, the connector, which was kind of the same way the CubeSats were, uh, were done. And well, open. We tried to make it open. We're actually not a company, so we're not gonna gain anything out of selling the product. We're a university. And actually the university is interested in education, so teaching to students. And well, open, uh, open science is becoming a topic, so why don't we try to make open hardware? Great, fantastic. We put the board on GitHub, people go, people play with it, and then they tell us something. What did we do in the meantime while waiting for the feedback? Well, we started building some systems, so you get here a nice list. Software has been put there. There's not a lot, but yeah, we're, we're starting with, um, with the hardware. And here you can see something that we have already done. You can see basically, whoop, point here, we got a more or less satellite bus set up. You can see the size if you look at the hand of the person that's, uh, that's holding the satellite. We have some basic ground support equipment. You see that big black board where you start to plug systems on top of each other. And then you see the other PCBs. That's basically my part is the radio. You see the PCB next to the coin. And it's challenging to fit everything in such a very, very, very small uh, footprint. Which is one of the reasons why people wanted to go to pocket cubes to try and see, okay, we made it on a CubeSat. Let's shrink, factor of two, everything. Which, well, it's now handy because you get a lot of components which are smaller, but there's all kinds of troubles that, well, you didn't expect and poof, they now they pop up. Well, collaborative. We tried to be collaborative and let's say the definition, what is collaborative for us right now? It's a small team in university, which is two staff, me and another guy, and two students at the moment working on this. Uh, collaboration is very tight. So basically, if there is a problem, I knock on his door and I talk, which is not always the case in big projects where you have a couple of hundred contributors all running their own parallel, uh, um, parallel developments. So that's a bit different. 
The other thing is you need to pick a tool to use it. We had already the tool, which is equal PCB, which is not open, but is also rather simple. Simple was also the rationale because we need to have students involved and we are at an aerospace faculty, not at an el electronic engineering faculty. So using tools which are a little bit more complicated would have been a problem. Eagle was a nice choice. Uh, we get XML files, which is great. We want to put it on GitHub. Fantastic. It works great. Um, yes, well, you can see theoretically everything is uh, friendly for uh, revision control theoretically and that was actually the big problem because revision control is made for software and typically code but xml is not structured as that so that was one of the big issues we had well what did we do github you can see the page we started with a library for the different components where well all the different ic's and all the different things end up in there you can see there's two contributors well i'm actually the Snoopy one and the other guy is the second contributor. So not a huge group, as I said, and with a very tight link. So a lot of times you get interactions with people, which should prevent problems, should. Uh, you see also the schematic and you also see the printed circuit board. We're actually building the board at the moment. We got it a few days ago. So that's why in the picture you could only see the bare PCB. And everything is there. Uh, well, I said open, almost. Almost. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people mentioned already the problem. It's not diff it's not easy always in university to have open things because, well, it becomes a political issue. What if some somebody uses the PCB that you put outside for something bad? They put my name next to it. Ooh, no, I'm not happy. So that's, I think, the biggest issue we faced so far. So we're trying to finally solve it and get everything out. As you can see, everything is all on GitHub. It's private, so it's a tick. But yeah, right now, not yet. I can't really tick it yet. Okay, what did we learn in this whole process? Why open source? Great, how do we share stuff? It was fantastic. If you need to set up a repository in the university, you need the computer, you need uh, to keep it up and running, you get the sysadmin that is gonna chase you if they release a patch, did you install the patch? It's a pain. So basically GitHub was great, just toss the files out there, all the students get a link, they play, they do stuff, it's fantastic, it worked. So I think we didn't choose open source at the beginning for the open concept itself, but more for its simplicity. And I think it helped a lot, which is one of the things I wanted really here to say, that keeping it open was much simpler for the whole group to work with. But a <laughs> couple of stuff came out. As I said, all the files are actually XML. XML is text, true, but with respect to code, it has a structure, which is not very easy, or it's not always easy when two people start working at the same time to actually merge what you're doing, and that's a huge pain. Here, really, the pain begins, because when something is simple, so you just change, as you see here, you just change a 9 into a 10, everything works perfectly. You're happy, the diff tool says everything is fine, great. Uh, merge, it all works. Now, ouch, if you start to add multiple things in the text, in the file, then you see that multiple components get uh, confused for one component, and then the merging tool doesn't really work. So this was a huge problem, and sometimes we had to merge things manually. Actually, that's the problem. The merging tools are not made for this. You need to move to tools that are dedicated to XML which actually are tied to the structure, which makes it quite complicated. We experimented a bit with tools like this that also offer visual diff. Well, this is very nice. I have to recommend it if you want to do these things. If more people look at the same PCB, then actually you see what changed, and that would be very good. So it helped us a lot. And uh, well, now I'm basically more or less on time. Uh, you can see here the GitHub page. We have a Twitter account where people dump the pictures. Uh, some more structured stuff goes in the main website. And here I am. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we will start with questions. Very interesting lessons learned. Uh, maybe with uh, Pieros over there uh, with the microphone. Yep. Pieros Paparias from Libre Space Foundation. 
Hey, um, thanks a lot for pushing the standard open. It's great to see more things like that. And I hope that we get also to see the boards, you know, open source uh, pretty soon. Um, <coughs> one question is that we, we created uh, for PQ9 a uh, uh, KiCad um, schematic and footprint. So what would be the, the best way? I, I mean, I know there is a logistical answer. You know, I just sent you the link and you do that. It's more of an open uh, question for you about how you would accept contributions um, around that. So people, you know, like you're looking into more contributions around the actual files or you would la rather have collaboration only on the standards, uh, you know, um, level? Well, to say the way it's considered at the moment, we were not expecting contributions. That's the first one. We were hoping for it. Great. So fantastic. I think I would actually be very open in having actually the files, not just, just adding a new project, adding a new, well, version of the thing. That would be great because at that point you see the standard is being used. There is version 1, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and you see the actual contributions of people. And that may also trigger more contributions because if the repository is only run by me, then yeah, also people that try to contribute don't really do it in the end. Elgo, please. Um, about your merging woes, uh, have you tried using Git LFS or the Git large file system? Uh, nope. Uh, we basically looked for now more into Git drivers and, um, well, other. we had our own scripts basically to do the merging to get a bit of the pain out. And the scripts, as I said, were mainly based on the structure because sometimes you get uh, multiple repetitions of uh, the same XML block which you need to not parse out. Um, just uh, just a re as a recommendation, have a look at it because it allows you to keep files in Git which are not really made for Git, like also binary files, and uh, you can do file locking, which is uh, mm. important if merging doesn't work well. Uh, I think it's supported on GitHub and GitLab, so um, check it out. No, oh, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Nice advice, Klaus. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that too, is uh, because I was running into the same problem like uh, I don't know ten years ago. And it's a, it's a mathematical problem, so uh, XML is not, it's not mergeable. <laughs> so you cannot do anything about it. Well, yeah. Actually, yeah. Somebody, Actually, somebody <laughs> jumped. Oh yeah. If you, just to comment, if you yeah. look online, there's like, f I think I found 14 or 15 articles in the last two or three years discussing the exact issue. So yes, there are solutions, but yes and no. <laughs> yeah, catching up on this question. Um, okay. I think yeah, that's indeed a, a, a problem to uh, to do the collaboration on hardware uh, using a tool that was designed for software projects. Because when you do a change, you can see that in the software what changed. Yep. But hardware, it's mostly uh, it's not the way that you work on it that it's saved. It's saved in these XML files or some other format. So it's hard to identify what actually changed. So I think the solution here is really to do a proper documentation of what has changed in between uh, the, the revisions. So you have to write it down um, so that it becomes clear to people. And the problem is really working together at the same time and doing hardware changes. I think this is almost impossible. So you have to do a coordination between uh, who's doing what and when. Yeah, I think this helped quite a bit to see what happened. But even if we were basically sitting well, probably 20 meters apart, it happened twice that, yeah, we didn't talk for two hours. Oh, yeah, I'm going to push this. Oh, actually, I pushed that 10 minutes ago. And then it all break. So that, that, that's tricky. So I think it's going to be even worse if you move to, I don't know, 50 people spread over different time zones, etc. There's a couple of solutions, partly commercial. One is called Easy EDA, I think, which is all online, nice web application. It looks great. We were a bit afraid right now to get locked onto a specific tool, which would have been another problem. Okay. Boris, Observatoire de Paris. Um, uh, talking about cooperation in hardware, uh, uh, the very smart idea behind uh, CubeSat Form Factor is the deployment system. So, uh, uh, have you started cooperation for that? And, uh, well, the, 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 the real business behind uh, the form factor is the deployment system. It's not the CubeSat. <laughs> no, definitely. Thanks for the question because it gives me another 30 seconds to talk <laughs> and <laughs> basically show this up. Prepared side. Yes, there's one company which is Gauss in Italy. You see it in the middle. They developed a deployer. They're actually the only ones that deployed 
for pocket cubes in 2013. Uh, right now they don't provide the service, it seems they don't provide the service anymore. There's a couple of guys in, uh, in Glasgow, Alba Orbital, they're trying to push it very hard, so you can see two of, the, two of their uh, designs. Hopefully within, uh, what, a year, there should be finally another launch. We also have a design for our own deployer. We're not that far away. But again, we are a university, which means it's a bit difficult to push these kind of things because also going through the qualification is complicated. I've seen the process for uh, the CubeSat deployers in the previous job. It takes years to pass all the qualifications, basically because they don't want your deployer to break. Nobody cares about the CubeSat. <laughs> okay, anyone has another advice or comment for, for Stefano? So how do you see your links uh, with the LibreCube maybe? Well, they were kind of one of the references we had when we started. So, okay, did somebody do it already? Great. So we looked around and then they had, uh, well, their uh, GitHub at the time. Again, the group seemed quite small. So there's every project has maybe, okay, in total there's a lot of people, but you see every project has maybe three, four contributors that you see. Mm. In the end, I think probably they faced the same issues. They went for a completely different tool, which was KiCad, fully open source. It's probably on our uh, roadmap to move out of Eagle, especially after licensing problems lately with uh, the acquisition of Eagle. So we'll probably look in that. The format is slightly different that uh, KiCad uses, which probably works a bit better, not but... Really. <laughs> yeah, not really over there. <laughs> uh, Dominic, do you want to react on the, the KiCad uh, with the microphone? Say. Dominic Maas. Well, th there's not much to say about KiCad. It's, it, it's just an ASCII file, it's not an XML, but if you change name or move a single trace, you get like, yeah, 20 lines of file changing and you don't really know what's happening. Maybe some sort of a merge tool that's not textual would be better, but yeah. Hmm. Could be actually interesting to look into a proper file format rather than into the, the tool itself. Maybe, maybe. And uh, how do you see the future steps for you uh, to work? And well, one of the things is we're looking into maybe the new tool to fix the, the licensing issues. That's an interesting one. Launch is another one of our uh, possible future steps. G the cooperation would be very interesting for us too. And in the end, what we want to do later on would be basically science. It's a university. So people do, I don't know, uh, they launch the CubeSat, why? These are very small objects. We would maybe want to try and see, well, can we actually track it with a radar? Or uh, do we see, or are we just tossing up more debris in space? So that's actually some studies we've been running in uh, in the couple of in the previous months to see what could be the real use of these platforms. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we can thank Stefano. So our next speaker has uh, an international networking story, motivational story. He didn't tell me anything about him, so I had to dig the internet. And the internet is talking. And what about the darkness? Whatever. Uh, he's a TEDx speaker. And here we have some TEDx organizers as well. Yeah? Yeah, yeah Attila, look at yourself. <laughs> and he, he does a lot. I mean, our next speaker does a lot to promote space activity with maker communities. And that's, uh, that's something cool. That's something we, we want to, to foster here. So um, let's see how he promotes do-it-yourself for space. So please uh, welcome uh, Joe Hinslish. Hins Hins <laughs> Perfect. Hello. So yes, uh, my name is Joe, and uh, an open source CubeSat inspired me to try and inspire others. So um, I don't work in the space sector. I'm not an engineer. I'm not really a software guy. I'm a maker. I'm an amateur. I'm a hobbyist. And in 2012, I just built this amazing machine. I designed and built a, I scratch built a miniaturized modular synthesizer from scratch. And I set myself the limitation to only use uh, vintage CMOS 4000 series ICs, never designed for audio. Why? Nah. 
Not sure, but there we go. Anyway, so it left a big, having finished this project in 2012, it left a big hole in my kind of maker project time. And so I was looking around on the internet for something that I could get my teeth into, my next project. And I came across this gentleman. Do you, do, who knows who this guy is? Anybody seen this? Yeah, yeah. So this is Mr. Ho Jun Song. Um, he is a South Korean conceptual artist. Uh, and about this time, he was developing the Aussie One CubeSat, which was an open source. Um, uh, CubeSat attempt that he built, he designed and built himself and eventually he got launched on a Soyuz. He fell into that 50% that didn't quite do it on, on orbit. But um, it, he was really inspiring to me because he presented as an artist and a maker and a, and a, and a kind of person. And I just found that really invigorating. And um, he kind of made space feel closer to me for the first time ever in my life. And it felt, I felt that sort of, you know, we talk about the democratisation of space. I kind of felt it for the first time. And so I thought, oh, this is good. This is what I'm going to put some hours into looking at all this stuff. And, and quite quickly I realised that I wanted to try and help other people have that feeling too. So it's led me on a mad journey of, of uh, sort of self-development. It's led me to get involved with various teams around the world and do all kinds of stuff. So just quickly, my self-development story. Well, one of the things I found is there's loads of nice online open things like the uh, MIT uh, uh, Intro to Aerospace Engineering MOOC. Now, I, that's probably the, the, the lowest qualification of anybody in this room. Uh, it isn't even really a qualification. But for me, it was a great starting point. It led me to go back to college at night school being interested in space. I realised there were loads of people in my communities online that would help me if I wanted to design an embedded system or to do kind of, you know, some PCB stuff. But what I felt was missing a little bit was people doing mechanical stuff and actually making stuff. So I took myself back to college and went and did a uh, diploma in performing engineering operations so I could use mills and lathes and all that kind of stuff. I got my radio amateur exam. Hands up if you're a ham. Yay! Okay, and uh, recently I realised there's loads of really cool books about space and loads of technical stuff that you clever clogs people have all probably read in your life, but I haven't. And when I start to read them, I realise like I need some degree level maths here because like you know there's a lot of calculus in here. There's a bit of Taylor series and sigma notation. I didn't do that at, at high school. So I've gone back and I've just done some uh, degree modules with the Open University. This perhaps is my proudest bit of self-development. I've uh, done some uh, high-power rocketry and earlier this year I attained my level one flight certification for uh, high-power rocketry under the UK governing body, which I'll come back to later. So I discovered Hojun, I discovered pocket cubes, uh, sorry, I discovered CubeSats and then I discovered, you're all right, you're good. Okay, I discovered uh, pocket cubes. Uh, this is the Ren pocket cube, and we have one of the three team members who, who developed and deployed the Ren pocket cube uh, with us today, Mr. Sasha. Salute you, sir. There we go. Um, and uh, I found this really inspiring a, a, a spaceship you can stick in your pocket. And I mean, for an outreach thing, that's really cool. If you can walk around at a maker fair and go, <laughs> Have you seen my spaceship? You've got to make sure you're in a maker fair or you might get arrested for that. But, but you, you know, it's a really, really kind of tantalising form factor. <laughs> so I did a few things. I set up an online forum that um, actually one of, the, one of the earlier electrical specifications that's still out there, that's open source, the PQ60 uh, specifications for pocket cube electrical interconnects, kind of a, a, a similar in a way to like trying to do the same stuff as the uh, PQ9 stuff that Stefano just talked about. Um, a, a lot of the community formed on my um, little forum uh, to kind of work together to make that. And meanwhile, I was in my shed in North Wales making rough kind of uh, uh, little models. This was a little model that had a, a radio and a microcontroller on it. And basically, it did a little RTTY beacon. And I could have it on one side of the desk at a make fair. And I could have my uh, laptop with a Realtek SDR dongle at the other end. And I could roughly show people kind of what was going on. So yeah, I started getting to go to uh, getting asked to go to make affairs to talk about satellite stuff, and uh, this is something that I've continued all the way along through through the last few years is getting out there and talking to people and just trying to put stuff in people's hands. I think is a really important thing that that otherwise space does isn't democratised. It just exists in these big buildings that that most people you know don't even know are there. Um, 
So I also got into uh, sort of developing um, different ways that we could perhaps consider making pocket cube chassis. So I actually kind of half built and half bought my own CNC milling machine. So again, I've used loads of open source stuff in, in my uh, kind of creating my um, CNC miller. I've used things like Linux CNC. I've used Gerbil, which is an open source G-code sender and all that kind of stuff. So open source gives me the tools to start creating tools to try and make stuff. So I remember putting this online on my blog and saying, hey, this is a way that I could skeletonize an aluminum extrusion and we could make pocket cubes like this. And so that's led to lots of people getting in touch. So actually, uh, an ex sort of colleague of, of Sasha's from the REN team contacted me and he said, oh, I've got a design for a new pocket cube. Any chance you want to make the chassis for me? So that's here. Um, that I Picture of it in your hand, that's, that's a lovely thing as well, to be able to show pictures of, look, this is, I made this and it's a spaceship and it's in my hand. Um, uh, so this came out to Germany. I've done ones for um, uh, Ozcube, which is the, an Australian amateur pocket cube um, project. Um, and I've uh, done a few bits for other people. And this is a, a concept that I've got going on. This is not the best model, but it's, um, I've got this idea for a, a bracketless um, pocket cube um, chassis assembly, mainly because um, if you were working in a maker space, this would be much easier to kind of realize. Um, and also, it should theoretically be stronger because, put simply, um, nothing kind of connects through the chassis and, and uh, the, the stack of um, uh, boards is kind of uh, puts a clamping compression uh, into the, the chassis system. So what I'm planning to do with this is um, I've been given some access, actually, to a shaker table. So I'm currently, I never dreamed at school I'd be doing things like this in my own time as a hobby. I'm reading all the NASA JEVS documentation and all the um, sort of launch providers, different do documentations around vibration profiles of launch vehicles. And I'm trying to come up with a, a, a good sort of array of tests, you know, sign, burst, random, all that kind of stuff, to, um, to try and validate this little design with this free access to a shaker I've been given. And then I'll publish it. I'll publish it and open source it, if it works. <laughs> of course. If it falls to bits, probably won't bother. Um, so um, uh, another brilliant part of the journey is uh, I, met, I get to meet these wonderful people. So we're going to hear from Saurav afterwards about um, some of the fabulous work that um, Orion Space is doing back in, in Nepal, in the University of Kathmandu. This guy is a legend. This is Rakesh. We, we have loads of people like Rakesh in this community. Rakesh is putting his hand in his own pocket. So he's an engineer originally from Nepal. He now lives in Switzerland and works. He's putting his hand in his pocket. He's buying kits and resources, and he's sending them back to uh, the University of Kathmandu because he realizes there's limited access for the uh, engineering students there to actually get hands-on kind of experience of space stuff. So it was a pleasure to give him a load of pocket cube kind of components that I'd made and, and send those back to Nepal. And that's quite inspiring for me. It makes me feel part of a pretty brilliant world where people are helping each other and uh, building all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay, I mean, look how good I make that look, hey? <laughs> So I've done lots of stuff with rocketry. Um, so this is a rocket that I uh, designed and scratch built uh, and then flew. And this is the one that I used to attain my high, level, uh, high power rocketry level one certification. Uh, Pantera flew beautifully earlier in the year. Um, so that's kind of, uh, I, you know, uh, rockets, are, rockets are a fabulous thing. If you take rockets to a maker fair, they're like a magnet. <laughs> rockets, that people just love rockets. And... Um, so this was uh, before the, the doors opened, but this was just for an example. This was Liverpool Maker Fair. Um, I took loads of rockets. There's some, there's some satellite, kind of 3D printed satellite, pocket cube chassis and stuff like that. There should be a CubeSat chassis somewhere there, but it's maybe behind the desk. We got about 2,500 people through that day. And, you know, I get all the stuff down and I put these rockets in people's hands. And young people, old people, anybody in between people, they just get a bit excited and they start thinking about the possibilities. And, you know, if we get like a fraction of a percent of those going off and looking at other stuff, then I feel that my job's done. Uh, apart from maker spaces, uh, from maker fairs, <laughs> what am I doing there? I don't know. Um, I've run a lot of workshops in maker spaces, so com usually community maker spaces in the UK, um, where I've done workshops where I've talked about um, rocket design. 
Um, and I've taken people through this open source software that we can use to, um, so it's called Open Rocket. It's a little Java application. It's open source. And um, it basically, it does all the complex kind of, uh, complex rocket science in a way. It does all the stability equations. It works on the Barrowman equations and all that kind of stuff. But you can design uh, a rocket in it and you can simulate it, but you can simulate it using any of the S sort of from the very small hobby model rocket kind of motors that there are out commercially available up to the very big kind of high power, the end of amateur rocketry where you're spending quite a lot of money on an MNO class um, uh, solid rocket motor or, or hybrid uh, motor. And you can simulate it in the software and see if it would work. And then I talk about how we can use maker space type equipment to... Um, to, to actually create these things. So using 3D printers, using CNC routers, using laser cutters, all that kind of stuff. It's a great package for outreach, so thank you, open source. Um, the other thing that's happened with Rocketry, because I kind of do all this activity and I blog and talk about it and tweet about it, is I got asked to join the UK Rocketry Association Council, which is frankly just like the Jedi High Council. That's pretty much it. It's as exciting as it sounds. But no, the UK RA, um, uh, at the UCRA, the UK Rocketry Association, we deal with a few aspects. So we're a bit like um, NAR or Tripoli, but for the UK, if you know what that means. If you don't know what that means, what it means is, is we, we maintain uh, the safety code for high-power rocketry in the UK. Um, we also broker the insurance for people to be insured when they fly um, in, the, in the UK. Ooh. And we also um, do various kind of outreach activities to try and promote rocketry in the UK. And uh, yeah, so any, anything to, we also do things like we have a large rocket scheme where we support universities who maybe want to build something that's bigger and more experimental and maybe steps a little bit outside of kind of what, what normal kind of high, high power rocketry might look like. And then lastly, the last thing I'll be doing, I come from a very beautiful but very rural area of North Wales uh, where we uh, don't have much kind of space industry. So I've been setting up these events where we've looked at, we've actually looked at some of the ESA, ESO um, uh, Space Exploration Masters themes. And then next week, if you happen to find yourself in North Wales, I'll be running another workshop uh, with a, a company that's coming to show us the API that they've developed uh, using the Sentinel stuff and the Copernicus program. I know I've run out of time, but I just want to say, all of you lot, thank you very much for having me. And keep being brilliant. Keep, like, if you're publishing open source stuff, it would be really wonderful if, as well as all your brilliant technical mm -hmm. stuff that needs to come into the community, you could actually um, maybe think of some simplified outreach you could do as well to, to try and meet more people and entice them into our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I have to all this. Uh, let's give a big yes to, to Joe, yeah? Ooh. Yes! Cheers. <laughs> so, any questions to Joe? Anything like, uh, let's do it together or something like that? Anybody? Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Uh, that's, that was a lot. You didn't even take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you did. So, uh, what, what, what do you expect from uh, this workshop for you? For um... I mean, I expect to kind of network, meet people, which I've done, make new friends, uh, and, you know, I've, I've, uh, so I'm also like a CAD user and I kind of develop my own boards and projects and stuff, so I've certainly, you know, picked up, even with my scant technical knowledge, I've kind of picked up a few tools that I'm going to go away and check out, yeah. and, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we're happy to see all the tools that you have. I've seen on Twitter just the days before the, the workshop that... You you mentioned uh, openrocket.info. I was like, what what is that? Yeah, uh, software can do my rocket. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's fantastic because it, it it can take yeah. people beyond the buying a kit model rocket into kind of actually building stuff for themselves. Which is, there's nothing wrong with buying a kit model rocket and flying it. I urge you all to do that. That's a fabulous yeah. thing to do in life. But to step beyond that and start to design your own is again part of making making all this feel yeah. a bit closer. How would you re redesign the Jedi, Jedi Council? Uh, I mean, the, any kind of government, like the one you have in UK? <laughs> How would I? Redesign. Redesign, redesign, redesign yeah. Um, I know that some of them are watching on the live stream, so I have to be a bit careful. <laughs> I guess, like a lot of these communities, like High Power Rocketry, like Amateur Radio, we have, there are perhaps areas where we need new blood 
and we need younger people coming through with new new ideas and a new kind of uh, you know sort of you know applying the the hobbies and the activities to kind of the new technical environment we live in where we have things like github and we have things like 3d printers yeah. in our houses or in our maker spaces and stuff yeah. so I, that's how i would reinvigorate yeah. the scene well thank you very much for all this motivation i think uh, we can give another yes to joe yes <laughs> and uh, thank you very much and please stay stand by so let's start, start the, the pitching session. So we'll start with a very short pitch of four minutes. And if you can make it in two, you have more, yes? And uh, we'll start from the top to the down. And uh, we start with Sasha. Sasha Toll, Compass Ground Station with three teleports. Can you hold this? Yeah. You have the, oh yeah, yeah. you have the timer. So Jose will be the timer for the pitch, and it will be rough and uh, four minutes sharp. I'll just bring this on stage if I manage. Yes? Oh, uh, the directory on the desktop. Ah, yeah. No, no, it's, uh, it's, it's already behind this window. There's a walking flip chart. Walking <laughs> flip. <laughs> so please, Sasha, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Top chrono. So four minutes. Yeah, my name is Sasha Toll, and uh, I am university not professor, but university teacher, and. Uh, Actually, I, I, I got this position because I had to uh, work, work up my, uh, my, 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 my the duties. The uh, FA Aachen helped uh, us uh, in making all the, uh, the uh, testing of REN, and uh, that was uh, Oop, sort of paying back was uh, that we helped then the FA Aachen to uh, set up a ground station. Uh, so now this is uh, four, more than four years ago, and uh, uh, we were very ent enthusiastic, and that's why we still keep continuing this. So uh, the problem is actually uh, many many CubeSats uh, uh, teams have the same problem. So they want to they want to design CubeSats, but at the end, all the resources and all the money is gone into that CubeSats, and there is no time left for. Oh man we have to perform a mission operation. And then they're going to start maybe with a hacker ref, uh, or, or they have a sort of uh, amateur radio rig uh, with not really trained people, and uh, not uh, the, um, the how to do this. And uh, this is what I want to do. Uh, it's going to be uh, in this. So uh, maybe the photos here. So this is our ground station. So we, we started with only one ground station. Now we have uh, three teleports. So we have uh, three different antennas uh, where we can um, point to, um, each uh, to more than uh, two satellites. So this is the, I ha don't have the time, that's why I can explain everything. So this is a, a simple diagram. Uh, I could also explain more flow sheets, but we have seen a lot of flow sheets today. That's why uh, I want to go uh, directly in the how to do this in, uh, 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 in reality. So normally you start with a propagator. In this case, this is Orbitron. From there, uh, uh, you have an, a driver. This is the MyDDE driver. And you need to connect this to your hardware. So your pointing hardware, the antennas, and your radio rig. And for this, uh, we create sort of a uh, front end which connects to the hemlip, which is the abstraction layer. And this abstraction layer allows you to connect to the different hardware. It's open source and it's really pretty cool. And uh, it allowed us to operate from our ground station, of our control room, to different locations where our antennas are. And uh, also, uh, you can operate with this DDE to TCP, then you can connect, for example, to HDSDR, because you also need to uh, follow up your uh, Doppler shift. 
And then comes the problem, so now you have set up your pointing and you get the signals, but now you want to get the products of those signals or the telemetry data. Uh, in former days, you just go to your mixer channel and then you say what you can hear and then you can decode, but this nowadays is not so, um, so, so easy with Windows. That's why we use also an open source hardware, this is for a virtual cable, and this is kind of a channel with which you can then uh, connect uh, to, uh, in this case, this is for example for decoding uh, NOAA satellites, so this is an, uh, a modem uh, and the decoder for the, for the image, this uh, VX2 EMG, or in the normal case when you have CubeSats, then you first go from there to the decoder, and uh, so this is the modem, and then you get the, 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 the UE frame, and then from there you go to the uh, different CubeSat teams, which have their telemetry beacon data visualization, and then you can visualize the data, or you have teams that directly provide uh, this software in one, uh, but this is really often okay. different software. So. Okay. Okay, Sasha. So you can okay. see. Time's Thank over. <laughs> Just. Five yes. minutes. <laughs> with with the yes, after this, four minutes, I'll let you give the yes. 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 You get the fair yes. <laughs> Just one comment. You can see there's uh, this time pressure because that's uh, elevator pitch. And we're talking about an uh, elevator in a maybe skyscraper in Frankfurt and not Bursch Al Arab in Dubai. So you have to be really quick. So please, the next one goes on the stage. On the stage. Who's the next one? So maximum four minutes, the less the best. And no slides. <laughs> Perfect. I guess so. The stage is yours. So <laughs> Dennis Rochal, Eclipse Professional Project Management Toolset for CubeSat programs. The stage is yours. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I don't have any slides. Um, but uh, I'm from a company called Sapienza Consulting and I uh, want to tell you about Eclipse, which is our uh, web-based application um, that is basically it's a toolkit for project management tailored for space projects. Um, our, uh, this application is used by you know, many uh, big guys like you know, Airbus, of course ESA as well, our, our biggest client. and. Um, um, and, and the point of uh, what we wanted to do with uh, CubeSats, we want to approach the community and uh, actually offer the, s the software for free for universities. So if you have a, a CubeSat uh, program project um, led by universities as academia or maybe some research institute, we actually would like to offer our software for free for you to use to facilitate all of those you know, boring processes of uh, reviews and designs, um, uh, non-conformances, documentation management, things that were mentioned here that are very important, I guess, for the 50% 50, 50, uh, failure rate of the <laughs> CubeSat at the moment. And uh, we would like to you know, uh, 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 contribute um, uh, and, and reach the community, offer this for free, of course, you know we are or we are a business, and uh, you may ask. Uh, it, it's not an open source as well, the application itself. So <laughs> I have to say, and you may ask, uh, what am I doing even here, uh, talking to you? But we think because at least we want to offer it for free um, uh, to to facilitate those processes that I was talking about, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, if we contribute, the uh, the ecosystem itself grows, and for us later, it means that we could reach more potential clients and uh, <laughs> uh, 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 that's that's of course the point but um, uh, again this is the motivation I I'm not you know uh, I'm not here to deceive or do anything this uh, anything like that but uh, again there are no strings attached we would like to offer it for free and if you have a university led uh, program and you would like to hear about this uh, about our application a bit more and uh, uh, please Talk to me, and uh, I will be here, there, next to the one of the tables. Let's express the yes for Denise, please. Three, two, one. Yes. Motivation. Next pitch, and uh, is uh, welcome on on the stage, Class Yimke. Where are you, Class? Where is Class? Can you, you know, Class is not here. He's scared, he's scared. He will be back. 
So next is Kartik Kumar from SatSearch, an open marketplace for space. So please, Kartik, the stage is yours. You have four minutes. All right. Um, how many people here have ever worked with a data sheet? How many people here think data sheets suck? So over the last 10 years, I've worked on multiple uh, design concepts for space missions. And I've hit my head against the same brick wall over and over again, wasting countless hours trying to find data sheets, scroll through them, understand what they're saying, and copy data into my simulation and modeling tools. This really isn't new space. In fact, this isn't even rocket science. It's a complete waste of time, and it's something that I discovered is actually solvable. So what we're actually trying to build is um, an entire platform that transforms the way we discover products in the space market. And the reason this is important is because if you dig a little deeper and you look at democratization of space and what the barriers are to entry in space, what you quickly discover is, well, you have things like launch, uh, you have regula regulations, but the other thing is that there is a distinct disadvantage if you're new to the sector because of a lack of openness of the supply chain. In fact, some of the largest companies in space, the traditional companies, hold, hold that advantage really, really close to their heart. If you try and ask one of these traditional players for their database of suppliers and you get it from them, please let me know because it's one of the most guarded secrets in the space industry. So what we're really looking to do is change this by building an open marketplace. I call it a marketplace for various reasons, but what it is under the hood is it's essentially opening up the supply chain and all the data associated with the supply chain. And having been doing this now for a couple of years and we have a website um, running where you can just go and browse through the 4,000 odd products that we have listed today. What we've discovered is there are vested interests in the space market that make this particularly difficult to do as an open effort. So my plea to you here is if you're interested in this, we'd love to essentially open up the entire stack and make this a community effort. But for that, we need the community behind, uh, behind this to help us develop you know, a library of components and parts and all of the best use cases and the, the, the practices that go along with uh, something like this so that we help uh, people basically gain access to the supply chain, understand where the space market is today, and that we build better space missions. So if you're interested, catch me anytime today. I'd be happily, happy to chat with you about it. And particularly if you have any ideas related to data sheets, because under the hood, that's fundamentally what we're, what we're transforming about the way the systems engineering process works. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, Kartik. The sounding yes? Yes. Ah, that's a good yes. Cool. So uh, unfortunately, the counting closes at two. So for logistic reasons, we will have to move to the counting. But we can accommodate one of the next one, which will fit in two minutes. Yeah. You take the challenge, Elge. You have two minutes sharp. So Elge, Astrodynamics Initiative. So there has been a question. And the question was, so your Astrodynamics guys are probably all doing the same thing in parallel. Isn't that stupid? And we said yes. So yesterday over, the, over beer we said, let's not be stupid. So uh, Kartik, Juan and I decided we scrap everything we have. We rewrite it in the one true language, which is, basi which is Visual Basic or Common Lisp, we're not sure yet. No, just kidding. It's not about programming language or programming language wars. It's about sharing ideas, sharing algorithms and sharing data. And we said, we call this, the Open Astrodynamics Initiative, you find it here, and we'll have a work group later to define our manifesto. See you this afternoon. Stay on stage, stay on stage. And so for Elge, one yes maybe? Yes! Woo, <laughs> that's a good one. So uh, we have to head to the counting for everybody to, to lunch. So thank you, Elge. Uh, and see you and see you after for, for the rest. So we continue at 2.30 in one hour uh, with the next sessions. Uh, before that, you can uh, go to demos, but um, yeah.
Very good. Let's have a good lunch now.